welcome to Farming Matters, which is a program of the North Central SARE program that essentially we help elevate the stories and share projects from um, our farmer rancher grantees. I am one of the hosts, Erin Schneider. I farm and I work for SARE, and I am excited to be with you all, and as well as um, Marie Flanagan, our communication specialist. Hello. And we, hey, and we have a special guest with us today, Peter Scold with Waxwing Farm, and he is here to share um, his story of his farmer rancher project, which is forcing Belgian endive and Treviso radicchio in the upper Midwest. Well, yeah, I can just give a quick introduction of, of myself. Um, so I'm Peter Scold from I own Waxwing Farm together with my wife, Anna Racer. Um, this coming season will be our 13th growing season, uh, growing mi mixed vegetables, um, both for CSA and uh, we sell probably half of our businesses selling to restaurants as well. We sell a little bit to the Prior Lake School District and uh, outside of the Twin Cities, um, but that's kind of the, the big breakdown. And um, yeah, we got... Um, through our restaurant work, we got interested in growing um, radicchio and kind of the logical extension of that has brought us to this project. Um, so it's just kind of, it, it was a desire to um, expand our options and diversify our winter offerings to our restaurants. And um, we thought it might fit the bill, but we needed a little uh, help to get over the hump of, of the initial investment and trial period. So the, that's why we applied for the SARE grant. And once we got it, it we put the project into, uh, into practice and um, had a few hiccups because of the COVID pandemic. But um, <laughs> we actually, it was, it was kind of nice. We, we delayed the project or extended the project by a year because of that. And um, we were able to Put a lot of stuff that we had learned into practice and i think the the project was actually better for it okay so um yeah this is just a little presentation i put together just to kind of um hit the high points of of what we learned um so as you can see it, the whole thing was about diversifying our season extension you know season extension in the upper midwest is really critical for vegetable farms um and so um we just wanted to explore an option to give us something um something a little bit more higher value than some of the root crops, especially for us uh, selling to restaurants, you know, root crops at smaller restaurant volumes are not super profitable. Um, so having something that um, is a higher demand, higher value product um, was, was something that we've been pursuing for our winter restaurant sales. And we thought that these forcing chicories um, would fit that bill pretty well. So, so what is a forcing chicory? It's um, chicories are, uh, a uh, crop that grows a lot like lettuce. So it's got a leafy top above ground and a single taproot down below. It's been used for thousands and thousands of years. It's originally from the Mediterranean area um, and it includes, you know, forage crops and also crops for human consumption. Humans and animals alike eat both the leaves and the roots. Um, the roots historically have been used as a coffee substitute. Um, so it's, it's um, a crop that is well known um, in certain parts of the world. Um, and then radicchio and endive are the things that are the, are the crops in the family that uh, most um, people are familiar with. Um, and so forcing chicories are a certain variety that you plant them in the, in the ground and you grow them like a regular chicory throughout the growing season, but then you dig them up and you bring them inside and you force them to grow inside a dark room or chamber, um, which forces them to grow without chlorophyll. And so you get a totally different product than what grows um, in the field. Um, so not only is it is it a, a unique um, kind of value added product for that reason, um, but it also, it tastes great too. It tastes a lot different than what you grow in the field. So yeah, this uh, just kind of gets at why we wanted to, to grow these things. Um, again, like I mentioned, it's about extending our season, our growing season, and finding a way to um, increase the value of some of our winter sales to restaurants in particular. Um, it worked really well with our, our farm infrastructure because we're able to use... Um, a walk-in cooler as our forcing chamber that is not used in the winter. Um, 
And then it also just kind of gives us a little bit more work to do in the winter, which in theory could take away some of the workload from the summer. Um, and it's, it's all about diversifying those winter sales. So growing this stuff is, uh, it's a lot like growing lettuce. Um, it doesn't really, if you're set up to grow lettuce, it doesn't require any additional equipment. Um, you can either direct seed it in the field or transplant it. Um, the most, the biggest difference there is uh, the impact on root shape. So this crop, even though um, a lot of people think of chicories as um, a leafy crop, when you're growing them for forcing, you really got to think about it as uh, you're growing a root crop. Um, and so um, I, I'll get to it later in the presentation about why root shape can in certain situations make a difference. But um, once you seed them and get them in the field, uh, it's just, like I said, it's just like growing lettuce. So you've got to keep them weeded, keep them well watered. It's a long crop, so they have to be seeded um, right around midsummer or early July um, in order to get them in the ground and have them grow enough to produce a sizable root that can be forced. Um, so for harvest, once you've, once you've grown them all up, um, we used an undercutter bar to lift the bed and then pull the roots out just like we would if we were growing carrots. Um, you trim the greens and you have to make sure that you leave the growing tip intact. You can see on the picture on the left, a lot of those roots have about one to two inches of green still left on top. That's critical for getting, especially for endive, for getting the right shape um, of the final product. Um, on the right, you can see we threw them into feed sacks that we stored in our walk-in cooler to help keep them um, at the right humidity. And they store just like any other root crop, best at about you know, 32, 35 with really high relative humidity. Uh, here's a picture of the forcing chamber. So like I said, the forcing chamber is a, we utilize a uh, walk-in cooler that we use in the summer for um, you know, storing cold sensitive things like tomatoes and eggplant and zucchini and cucumbers. Uh, but in the winter, that infrastructure was idle. So this was uh, this project was a really good way to utilize that idle space that was otherwise just sitting there. Um, we had these galvanized steel tanks custom made for this project. And you can see kind of just there's red hoses connecting each of the tanks so that we can circulate water through the entire system. Um, I think that's helpful to keep the water aerated and keep keep things healthy, but I don't think it's critical. I think you could um, get by with a much simpler system of just some Tupperwares with roots in them and uh, you know a couple inches of water that maybe you changed every couple, you know, maybe once a week or something like that. Um, so it certainly doesn't have to be this sophisticated. I think that um, we just wanted to to really have a system that. Um, fit the best like larger scale commercial systems that we could um, identify. And so a lot of the larger commercial systems had had the same kind of water bath circulating water, um, but I don't think it's critical. So this is the actual process for forcing them for Tardivo Radicchio. You dig them up uh, from the field and they pull them out of storage. And on the left, you can see that these plants were transplanted. So you can see that the roots are a lot more kind of splayed out and gnarly um, we trim off most of the greens. So on the left, you see uh, the root with a lot of the greens attached still. And then on the right is what it looks like before we put it into the bulb crate for forcing. Um, and then on the right hand side, you can see a bulb crate that's ready to go into the forcing chamber. So um, you peel off most of the greens um, because the green leaves eventually decay and die and become kind of a slimy mess. And so the less of that that you bring into the, you know, into the forcing chamber, the less cleanup you have to do on the backside. And then once you put them into the forcing chamber, it takes about three weeks for them to grow. You can see these ones on, in this picture, we trimmed all the greens off. Um, so there's no decaying matter and that actually worked pretty well too. So, um, but once they're in there, you just have to make sure that the water level is sufficient so that the roots have something to drink and that you don't accidentally leave the light on. <laughs> That's the biggest thing is any light will cause the plants to start photosynthesizing, which degrades them. For harvest, um, you take the bulb crates out, trim off the root, and you can see in the picture, you leave kind of a little 
little stub of the root. That's at least the traditional Italian way to do it. Um, uh, and you clean off all the bad leaves and then soak it in cold water to kind of let it rehydrate just a little bit. It does tend to get a little dried out in the forcing chamber. And then once you rinse it clean, you can shake it dry and package it um, for sale and just keep it dark so it doesn't start photosynthesizing. So endive is a little bit different. Um, you can just trim them in the field uh, and you wanna make sure, like I said before, you leave the right amount of greens intact. On the left picture on the left, you can see the root on the bottom was trimmed too close and you can see that there's five or six small little sprouts that are coming off of the sides. So those aren't gonna be marketable because they're gonna stay really, really small. Um, whereas the root on the top was trimmed properly and you can still see the growth tip of the greens intact. So that's gonna form a nice tight head growing from the middle of that root. So that's, that's the critical thing that we learned. And that was one of those things that uh, we didn't learn that lesson the first year that we did it. And so extending the project by a second year um, allowed us to kind of learn from that mistake and, and have a lot more success the second year. Um, endive is, is um, grown more on a commercial scale. So it's a, more of a familiar crop than the forcing radicchios. And so it's been bred to develop that really nice straight taproot. Um, so if you direct seed the Belgian endive, it'll grow a nice straight taproot that then can be packed really tightly into the bulb crates. You can see on the picture on the right that we fit, you know, more than double the number of endive roots into one bulb crate. So it's a much more efficient use of space. So then harvesting, um, endive grows a little bit slower. It takes more closer to six weeks. Um, you can see here this picture we've got on the top, there's some um, chicones that are just about ready to be harvested. And underneath we have a, um, some roots that were started a, a couple weeks after that. So they're just starting to grow. So it's, but it's basically, you can just cut them off of the, um, the root, either with a knife or just by snapping them off, trim off any leaves that are you know ill-shaped Ill or have any kind of tinge of green to them. And then you can pack them right from the forcing crate um, for sale. And again, keep them dark so they don't start photosynthesizing. We did notice that the, the endive was more likely to start photosynthesizing than the radicchio if you weren't careful. Um, marketing, you know, the restaurants were our primary customers for this uh, product. They're both definitely specialty products. Um, the Tardivo is not commercially available anywhere in the U.S. that we were, were available. So um, that helped it command a higher price, but also because it's less familiar, you know, the, the market options are, are more limited. Um, for sure, specialty restaurants that either have an open mind or are, have previously worked with it are, are the easiest targets. Belgian Endive, on the other hand, um, is historically more of a large scale production. It's more of an industrial crop. So it's, it's available from regular wholesalers, vegetable wholesalers. Uh, it shows up on a lot of winter restaurant market or restaurant menus. Um, so because of that reason, the market price is a lot lower. Um, so you need to sell in a higher volume um, in order to make, the, make it work cost-wise. Um, I think the opportunity is definitely there for that, but um, it's, I think you would have to do it on a pretty significant volume. Um, other options are winter's farmer's markets, you know, in the same way that uh, for restaurants, it's a really unique, different crop to differentiate ourselves from the co competition in the winter. You know, if there's a winter farmer's market, you know, just having these things on your stall is going to just everyone's going to come and take, at least take a look. Um, so then you can tell the story um, and, you know, you have to do a lot of customer education, I think, but um, the opportunity certainly is there to get pe people to at least try this unique product. And then, you know, if they're specialty grocery stores, I don't think that necessarily either of these products are going to show up in regular everyday grocery stores, but um, there's certainly a possibility for, um, customers, regular, you know, individual customers who either already know about these um, 
products or are interested in getting their hands on something unique and different. So there's other radicchio varieties that are either meant to be forcing varieties, like this Isontina in the middle is grows really, really small and it's got a really vibrant, cool color, but um, is, you know, the market for that is probably pretty limited. We've been growing the Chicory Rosa on the left. Um, that is not specifically a forcing variety, but in the upper Midwest, it, it works that way. Um, so we've, we've had some success growing that crop as a forcing radicchio. And then, like I mentioned, um, you know, the, the Belgian endive, I think for our scale, we found that, um, the, the forcing radicchios are more cost-effective for us just because of the higher price that they, uh, command. Um, but again, if you wanted to really scale up and do uh, an acre or two of Belgian endive and, you know, talk to a wholesaler and try to kind of corner the, the market, um, I think that there's possibility there. And I think that, you know, that it could be cost effective. So I think there's definitely opportunities um, that have been illuminated by this, this uh, project. Yeah. And so, I mean, couldn't have done it without North Central SARE. So uh, just thank you for everything that um, the organization has done to support and fund this project. It was, it was a lot of fun and we learned a lot and we certainly developed a practice that we're going to keep using. So uh, overall, it's been a huge success. What does like, so for someone experiencing radicchio or endive for the first time, how would you describe that taste or like, yeah, it's, um, it's definitely bitter. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think, um, that's the, the first thing that, um, turns people off is that mm-hmm. it's, it's got a bitterness to it. Um, you know, because we work with the restaurants, we've been, they've been slowly nudging us to growing a lot of radicchios. A lot of restaurants are, are really excited about that. So, you know, there's kind of a spectrum of like the regular main season, um, radicchios, like, with um, kind of frisé and um, oh gosh, no, uh, escarole are which are endive crops um, that are on the milder side, and then there's kind of the there's the kioja, which are like the round softball red radicchios that you see in the grocery store or in the salad mixes. Those are kind of like less bitter in the middle, and then you can go all the way down, and there's some really wacky ones that are like um, punjarele is an is a it's like basically you're you're harvesting the flower stalk, so it's real bitter, real tough. But then you soak it in the cold water and it mellows it out. Um, so so bitterness is kind of the key. There is the main feature, but there's it's you know it's kind of hard to describe the flavor mm-hmm. unless you you have it. And then the um, these forcing varieties because they're just using they're not using photosynthesis for their, they're just using cellular respiration. So there's a whole different metabolic pathway that's happening within the plant. Um, and so it's just, they're, they're different um, chemical compounds that are being formed within the leaves. So it's, um, the sweetness is like, it, it's less bitter, more sweet, but it's not like sugary sweet. It's kind of, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's, it's hard to describe. Did the crop find you or you found the crop? I, I guess what I mean by that is like, could you imagine yourself when you embarked on farming? Like, yeah, endives. It's going to be all about endives or like. No, no. certainly not. No, it was, <laughs> this was not at all on my radar at all. I mean, it's, um, I've always enjoyed radicchio, but, it, but even, you know, prior to getting into growing it myself, you know, it was not a, not like it was a staple on my dinner table as a Scandinavian heritage person from, Minnesota, you know, um, it's not a, not a part of my culinary background, but, um, so it it was definitely working with the restaurants that has, has kind of pushed us to broaden, um, our, our scope of the crops that we grow. Um, you know, every once in a while we sneak radicchio into our CSA, but it, it doesn't usually go over super well. Uh, it's not a, it's not a universally loved thing like, uh, potatoes or tomatoes or anything like that. You trim the leaves. And then you have these leftover roots. Um, what do you do with those? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> right now they just go in the compost. Um, but I think that, you know, again, being that they are um, 
historically have been a forage crop. Um, there's some value for, I was just reading before this uh, meeting that historically they were um, used as a substitute for oats for horses because there's a similar kind of nutrient breakdown. Um, so for sure, it, you know, if you had livestock on the farm through the winter, uh, one these spent roots could, you know, just go into the pig pasture or into the, you know, par cow parlor or horse barn, whatever. Um, I think that's actually how these first got discovered. They would dig them up and then stick them in the corner of a barn. And then in the spring, when things started warming up, they'd start to sprout or if like water was dripping on them, they'd start to sprout and grow. Um, but in the darkness of the back corner of the barn. And so then, you know, people as they're feeding the horses or whatever, like snap one off and take a bite. And it's like, oh, this is unique and different. <laughs> Roasted chicory is a coffee substitute. So I think you could talk to coffee shops and see if that was something that they wanted to try getting locally. Um, it's showed up in um, stouts and porters and from oh. breweries. Um, so I think you could talk to brewers about. So I, I do think that there's an opportunity for turning that into an additional revenue stream as well. And if nothing else, feeding it to livestock so that you, you know, recapture that value. Can you use the root more than once? There, um, there's some speculation that yes, you could. Um, I, I, I read some in our initial research, I read some um, sources that said, yes, you can. I think maybe if you were to, it, the, the tricky part is like how you were, would harvest that chicken. Mm -hmm. Because then if, if you cut it low enough to keep it as a nice tight um, chicken that doesn't just like all the, all the um, leaves fall off, uh, you're going to cut it low enough that you're going to damage that, that central growth tip. Um, so I think, you know, maybe snapping it off, you could, um, but it's not something that we explored. It's interesting. It's beautiful. It's like lots of sequencing and just like, I thank you for taking through that, whole, taking us through that whole process and for other farmers as well, just like, and I can just feel your joy in this discovery. Of <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. Exactly. And it's, you know, again, it, I, I think that, you know, for small scale agriculture, um, you know, especially working with restaurants, mm -hmm. a lot of the farmers that we know that are, you know, growing mixed vegetables in the winter, they switch to like large volumes of a couple root crops, mm -hmm. um, you know, selling to school districts or uh, wholesalers or grocery stores, that kind of thing, which, you know, is certainly viable. And, um, but, you know, we, as the, re as the farm that we are, we're, we're sized a little different. And we found that every time we try to dip our toe into that really larger scale, like moving pallets of things at a time, mm -hmm. uh, it always, you know, we're just not geared for that. So mm -hmm. we, we, we were really hoping that this would be something that would allow us to kind of keep that smaller scale, but just, you know, increase the value of, of those smaller, smaller deliveries to restaurants in the winter. And, um, and it, it really did pay off. 